Please select your floor. Go ready. to the second episode of Dying to Know. If you missed the first episode, you can still catch it on YouTube where you'll learn more about the game, about the release date, and catch the latest gameplay trailer. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the infected in Dying Light 2 with some of the people who helped create them. But right now, I'm sure you're wondering, where is Jonah? Well, Jonah is hard at work right now in LA recording some of the voices for Dying Light 2, so we'll forgive him for his absence, but he has left a message for you. Hey guys, uh, good news. I'm in LA and we're finishing up voice recordings for Aiden in Dying Light 2. And uh, this particular quest we're working on right now showcases a lot of the disgusting, horrific freaks of nature that you're going to fight in the game itself. Um, the better news is that the episode today of Dying to Know focuses almost entirely on those monsters and Leia is going to tell you all about them and it's going to be fantastic. The bad news is... I'm not going to be there in the studio, at least this time. I'm going to be in this studio recording lines for a while. <laughs> but uh, Leia's going to take good care of you. Uh, we're going to make sure that you get everything you need to know, and I, I, I think i, I think I got to go back to work. Um, Leia, the stage is yours. Good night, good luck, and remember to stay human. Thanks, Jonah. Well, we might not be in sunny L.A. right now, but we do have something just as exciting to talk about. The monsters. We're going to be looking at how they're created. We're going to be venturing into the night in a new gameplay trailer. We're going to be seeing what's new on Techland GG and more. But first, let's take a moment to thank our amazing community, you. We love seeing you react to our content and your comments help motivate the entire team. So thank you. Over 750,000 of you tuned into the first Dying to Know live stream. Over 10 million of you have watched the first gameplay reveal trailer, and over 17 million comments have been left across our social media channels on all platforms. It's amazing. Thank you. There is literally nobody we would rather explore the darkness alongside than you. Our first guest today is Timon Smektower, the lead game designer for Dying Light 2 Stay Human. Hello, Timon. Hi, hello. Hello, welcome to the show. Um, so, we're talking about monsters today. And where do monsters start? They start in the imagination of the game designers like yourself and the others. So, what can you tell us about them? So, first of all, I think it's important to say that our monsters used to be sick and suffering people who just didn't manage to find UV light or any other cure in time. The virus causes them a lot of pain and it makes them suffer. And they are not driven by hatred, but by instinct, their new nature. Right, okay, so what does that process look like for turning from a human to a monster? So at first, you get symptoms similar to fever. And at this stage, the process can still be slowed down or even paused. But if you spend too much time in darkness, the sickness progresses and your symptoms become more severe. And eventually, you will turn into a volatile, a quick, agile, aggressive, bloodthirsty monster. Right, and if it gets to that point, is there anything you can do? Is it reversible? Well, unfortunately, once you have turned, there's no way to revert. Mm. And now the UV light becomes your enemy, so if you spend too much time in the sun, you will degrade into a slow-moving and shambling biter. So, with that sun sensitivity then, is it fair to say you're kind of safe outside in the daylight, apart from the biters? Uh, well, yes and no. Of course, you will see less monsters on the streets than during the night, but you will still encounter some. As the sun weakens them, they try to find a place to hide, usually inside buildings. Okay. But don't go into those nests at day as they are swarming with the infected. Right, okay. So, I mean, you know, if I fancy going in during the day for some reason, is there any chance? Uh, no, no, absolutely oh. no. So, uh, because <laughs> if you do it during the day, it's a certain death. Right. But you can explore those places at night. Okay. 
and because of that we have greatly improved our stealth mechanics so now you can go to the entire dark zone completely unnoticed mm -hmm. that is as long as you stay quiet and don't misstep right okay which is like my kryptonite because i will absolutely <laughs> kick a bucket back no absolutely <laughs> don't do that never do that never face face kick no never kick the bucket no you're dying um <laughs> and not only that but you can encounter other special infected as well um so can you tell us a little bit about those uh, absolutely so they were created by chemicals that made the infection progress too fast, causing mutations. So sometimes when you stay quiet, sneak behind them and observe them, you will see that they seem to be uncomfortable in their new bodies, as if they didn't have time to get used to them. Wow, okay. And they're all like quite unique and different as well, aren't they? Well, yes, everyone is unique. And uh, for example, the Revenant, uh, who is my personal favorite, uh, he has those things coming from his back almost like wings. Mm. Uh, he's very scary, very dangerous, but also smart and intelligent. And to capture this part of his nature, we have kept his appearance more human. I think smart and intelligent are two of my least favorite things when encountering an enemy that sounds that scary. <laughs> wow, well, um, thank you so much for joining us today, Timon. It's thank you for having me. We take a sneak peek at some of those monsters in action in this brand new gameplay video. So, you have an army here? Oh, the peacekeepers. Seriously riling up the bazaar folks. I'll proceed with caution. Are we going? You uh, wanted to show me something? Sure. Follow me. You won't get far without a biomarker. Without it, you don't know when you turn. <clears throat> Biomarkers are at the GRE hospital. I'm waiting by the lobby. Company here. Don't move. 
Yeah, that's great. Sorry about this. What? And sorry about what? <laughs> about that. On behalf of all its whores, bandits, and idiots, I christen you a citizen of Villador. Fuck. What? You're about to turn. Get into the light fast. And if you want to see how the creatures we've just seen were created, Kasia Bech, the lead character concept artist, and Dominic Vashenko, the lead 3D character artist, are here to tell us more. Hello, welcome to the show. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, so my first question for you today is, how did you come up with all of the like forms and shapes for the monsters in the game? Yeah, so first we had to create a general idea of how virus could evolve visually. Okay. We used elements from various skin diseases, like hardened tissue working as organic armor, blisters filled with yellow pus as uh, weak points, and some burned skin scars to create interesting texture on the skin. Yeah. Yeah, for example, we have Demolisher and his blisters, they shine at night. And that's because we wanted our monsters to be like really visible and recognizable in the darkness. Yeah, for sure. And um, you kind of must have had this idea from the start then that you wanted the demolisher to be the bigger and tougher of the monsters, right? Yeah, we knew that he would throw heavy objects mm. uh, or charge. And our goal was to make his silhouette really monumental and aggressive just to like to show that strength. Okay, so the Demolish is probably one of the bigger monsters in the game. Um, but have you got an example of like the smaller monsters, maybe? Yes, of course. For example, we have Banshee. She's insanely fast and agile. Because of that, she needs to be, of course, smaller than the Demolisher, and she doesn't have like the hardened tissue that we saw on him. But I wouldn't mess with her. Yeah, we really wanted her femininity to show. So she's wearing a dress, though it's pretty ragged now. And also she's wearing a jewelry that's fused into her body while she was turning. And her hands grow larger than the rest of her body. Almost same like in Demolishers, but here the disproportion is much bigger. Wow, yeah, and no, I feel like there's a story behind that with like, the jewelry fuses the body, that's so intense, um, but why are her hands so big? Basically they are her weapons, so yeah, because she strikes uh, from above, uh, her fingers grow longer and also sharper to cut, not to hit, because right. yeah, so due to her lower strength. Yeah, she's going for the kill yeah. then, <laughs> she knows. <laughs> exactly. Um, so does that mean we can be expecting Banshee to jump from the roof down on us? Yes, she's so fast and agile that she might surprise the player like, by striking them either. Wow. So, yeah, something that no other like monster can do. No, okay, yeah, can't see the demolisher doing that. Just, <laughs> just <flat>. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today and uh, sharing more about the process of design. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you like stories, we've got a bit of a treat for you. When it gets dark at night and the monsters leave their lairs and roam the city streets, the residents of the city like to gather in their safe spots under the UV lamps for protection and wait out until the dawn. And when they're doing that, they like to kill time by telling stories themselves about Banshee, for example. If you're wondering why she's wearing that beautiful necklace and ball gown, well, now you can find out. This is all the world
Lakeland have partnered with Dynamite to create a comic series, and this is just a teaser of what to expect. You can get a physical copy yourself in stores soon, but if you head to techlandgg.com, you can also get a digital version for free. And also on Techland GG, there is plenty more content. You can find a brand new starter pack, more information about the monsters. You can get a six piece outfit coming very, very soon. More information about the game entirely, the dying to know shows, basically everything. So why don't you check it out for yourself at techlandgg.com. I know quite a lot about monsters now, but if there's one thing that intrigues me, it's how do you make something so inhuman and terrifying come to life in game? Luckily, we have the one person who can answer that question here with us today. It's Dying Light 2's animation director, David Lubrica, and he's here to tell us more. Uh, welcome, David. Hello, welcome. Hello. Uh, so you work with the animation team in taking all that concept art and bringing it to life and having like an actual living, breathing monster in the game. So where do you even start with that? So the process starts with creating a prototype uh, and then designing choreography based on this. Uh, then we take it to the mock-up shoot and that's where we have our actors interpret the movements and we actually learn from them also. That gives us some extra ideas. Uh, but the real magic happens uh, when we take all the things we captured and start putting it in, into the engine and into the game's language. Okay, can you give us a, an example of that in-game? Sure, uh, like uh, Volatile for example. So he sniffs around, he uh, searches for his prey, he has those cut-like jumps, but many of those movements are actually characteristics of uh, the creatures we know from animal documentaries and he combines them with uh, some new ones and unique ones and that's what makes him who he actually is. Oh, okay, okay, so I'm going to be like in-game, I'm going to be searching him out and trying to see all these little details you've made, which is probably not the best idea because I think that will get me killed. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, with him it's not the best idea, uh, but we have other infected and uh, all of them actually have very, very distinctive and interesting behaviors. Okay, so you're giving them all like unique personalities in-game. Sure, uh, so let's take a look at Howler, for example. Uh, he doesn't fight, uh, he's more of an alarm, like this uh, light tower, you know, searching for prey. Um, he uh, screams to call other infected when he spots human, but uh, also he sometimes rises on his tiptoes uh, to see better, to see his surroundings, uh, but that also makes him uh, look like this very scared, you know, panic child. Why is he so scared? Well, it's because uh, there are some traces of his humanity in him. Um, he, he really wants to scream, but the virus has attacked his uh, lungs and, and vocal cords, and that would just hurt him too much. Uh, he's helpless. But they all just lose this fight with their instincts then at some point? Totally. Um, actually, they uh, rather evoke pity. Uh, they, they, you can see that they can notice the deformations uh, the virus has done to their bodies. Uh, they can touch them, they can uh, experience something like seizures, uh, and you can see that all this aggression, all this rage is repressed in them. Um, and uh, you know, something might trigger it, and that's usually an opponent, and you can see that all this energy uh, is released and uh, transferred on the opponent, on the player, for example, us. I can't wait to see that in-game. Um, but I want to talk about Banshee, because we mentioned her earlier. Um, we've seen how she looks, but like, how is she animated? She's, uh, she's a curious one. She, uh, she has those really long, deformed fingers, uh, and she uh, uses them to fight, but kind of like a byproduct. And we had to imagine how she would feel about them. And we thought uh, they must really bother her, right? Yeah. Uh, she can get really clumsy with them. She falls on them in this very uncontrolled way, wow. uh, as if she was forgetting she had them. So it's a bit of a curse and an asset for her then. She's like conflicted. Totally, she's really conflicted. You can actually see her sometimes actively hunting you. Uh, and then at some point, if she gets too close to you during combat, she'll uh, just suddenly jump back and cower oh. as if she was trying to resist the virus. Uh, but ultimately, she would just give in to its power. Uh, wow, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much, David. Thanks for having me. wondered which of the infected in the world of Dying Light you might be, then I've got good news! You can check out a quiz at dyinglightgame.com forward slash which monster and find out whether you'd be, I don't know, a violent volatile, a tough demolisher or maybe a human. 
take the test and share it with your friends because, you know, you need allies out here in the darkness, even if you're an infected. Or well, maybe especially if you're an infected. And if you can't wait until December the 7th to find out more about the world of Dying Light, why not check out what's been added to Dying Light 1? Within the last month, over half a million new players have entered the world of Dying Light, and we've had the highest number of active players across all platforms since launch, which is amazing. You are amazing. Thank you so much for your support and your interest in the world of Dying Light. More and more fun content is on the way to Dying Light 1 also, like the Savvy Gamer DLC or the 4th of July event. And if you head to Techland GG, you could get your hands on this in-game weapon, the Wasp. So, you know, why not check out Techland GG, as if you needed more reason to. Um, more and more fun content is added to the game regularly, so keep checking it out with more coming soon. All right, well, since Dying to Know is about the world of Dying Light 2, there's still something else we need to hear about, if you pardon the pun, because we're going to be talking about the sound design of Dying Light 2. If you've ever wondered about where the roaring, the growling, the screaming that covers the streets of the city at night comes from, then you're in the right place, because we're going to be talking to one of the lead sound designers to tell you more. Senior sound designer Tomek Shedak is here with us today. Hello. Hey, nice to meet you. You too, hello. Um, so, first question. Do the monsters have their own language? They technically are not hurt uh, creatures, so uh, they didn't develop sounds to communicate with each other. Although, there are some exceptions. For example, Howler, when attacked, he would uh, scream to alert other, in other infected, and then you can get yourself into really big troubles very, very, very soon. Let's talk about the process of actually creating those sounds, though. Um, so you have to imagine what a volatile might sound like from scratch, and where do you even start with that? Well, you know, the virus uh, deformed the infected in very different ways, and you have to reflect it in their, uh, in their voices. So, for example, uh, the acid-spitting monster, you know, has to have sound with some kind of acidic uh, yeah. characteristics, some, uh, some watery, hissing uh, stuff in it. And there is the Banshee, a woman monster, and her voice is high-pitched and, uh, and vibrating and, and really, really scary. So you work alongside your twin brother Wojtek, and he also records uh, a lot of the sounds that you use to create these monsters, and we actually have a video of that process, so uh, we can have a closer look at what that entails. So now you can see how it, how it works. We always start with the human throat because all of the infected uh, were humans once. Yeah. And then the creative part is coming and a lot of sound design magic is happening. Also, we have to cover a lot of emotions in, in the infected voices yeah. because you have to know, I mean, the player has to know if the infected is, uh, is in pain or is super aggressive or is maybe dying. You have to pass this message through the voice and the message has to be very, very, very clear. So basic monster like a biter has 700 voice assets. So the wow. scale is, uh, it's enormous. Yeah, that's a lot to try and communicate in yeah. <laughs> sounds. <laughs> um, so that's the monsters, but what about the entire city? Our city is dying. Yeah. So we had to find these abandoned places where there is no sound of the civilization. We visited abandoned factories, we visited post-military bunkers. We went to the forest at minus 15 degrees because it sounds completely different than in the summer. And we climbed up the mountains. It was a lot of uh, interesting places we wouldn't visit without Dying Light 2. And uh, you know, at night with the good headphones, you can definitely enjoy it. I cannot wait to hear it. It sounds like you've got a fascinating job. I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. And you can check out the hard work of the Shadag brothers and their teams when Dying Light 2 releases on December the 7th. You can become a part of that amazing universe. Remember the UGC contest? 
it's already started. So just show us your art to be in with a chance of winning a copy of the already sold out collector's edition and join the world of Dying Light 2. Just look at all the amazing things people have already created. Dying Light 2 releases later this year on December the 7th and you can pre-order it right now. But if you want to dive into the universe immediately, then why don't you check out Techland GG for more news, updates, and to grab your free copy of the Banshee comic. All right, I think we know everything about monsters now, except for one thing, how to defeat them. So stay tuned for the next episode. We'll be looking at different combat styles, weapon crafting, and the iconic Dying Light 2 parkour, which was designed in cooperation with this man. Bien sûr, il y aura des mouvements originels de David Bell, maintenant c'est à vous de les trouver. <rire> By the way, I'm Hakon. Yeah? You'll do Wait, better what? on your own, trust me. Thanks for watching episode 2 of Dying to Know. And remember, the virus isn't the only thing that makes a monster. So stay human. <laughs>